Um, so I'd just like to start off by introducing myself for those of you I haven't met. My name is Joseph Di Battista, and I'm the current curator in the theology section at the Australian Museum, and I'm chairing today's session. So it's my pleasure to introduce our very own Dr. Elena Copria Nova as our speaker today. Uh, Lena is a senior research scientist in the marine invertebrate section at AM, uh, and her research focuses on biodiversity, systematics, and the phylogeny of polychaetes, with a particular focus on the calcareous tube worms, as well as biofouling marine invasive species. Um, Lena completed her undergraduate degree at Moscow State University, her master's degree at the University of Arkansas, and her PhD at Flinders University in South Australia. Uh, Lena is a highly published author. This includes a number of new species descriptions, regional checklists, and volumes describing the invertebrate materials collected on research, research expeditions. And so with that, I'd like to hand control over to Lena for her presentation that is actually being made live from the RV investigator in Darwin. Uh, and she's going to talk a bit about the history of using this amazing platform to survey the abyssal depths in our ocean. So thank you very much, Lena, for, for speaking to us today. OK, so I just would like to start basically that to show you guys the team. We're all here in the chief scientist's um, office. And then I'll start with actual presentation, more or less now. OK, so although the abyssal zone of the ocean, which is at depths below 2000 meters, is the largest habitat, habitat on the planet, it mostly remains unexplored environment due to obvious difficulty working at such great depths. So um, I would like to actually talk about recent um, research involvement of uh, AMRI scientists in the deep sea exploration. But just before I do this, um, let's um, step back in uh, time to mid 19th century and see how it all started. Is there life on the bottom of the ocean? Believe it or not, this question was seriously asked at some point in time. This guy on the right, right is Edward Forbes, and um, he was a distinguished British naturalist who in 1841 participated um, in an expedition to the Mediterranean where he dredged uh, samples from the deepest waters examined to date. As a result, um, Edward Forbes developed what his uh, notorious azoic theory. Basically, it states that there is no life in the ocean below about 550 meters. And um, believe it or not, this, this uh, theory was actually accepted by the public as the whole idea seems kind of logical, given the enormous pressure, the cold temperature and eternal darkness of this environment. Um, this man, I'll, yeah, this man on the right is uh, Charles Wavell Thompson. He was one of the Forbes students, but he didn't like this, his theory at all. In fact, he did everything in his power to disprove it. He convinced the Royal Society and the Admiralty to finance an ambitious project. The this project, the cruise on uh, HMC, uh, HMS Challenger, was the first expedition organized for a very specific purpose. And it aimed to examine the deep sea floor and answer comprehensive questions about the ocean. Um, so I would say for the 19th century, the importance of this particular expedition was uh, similar to the um, importance of um, space programs of the 20th century. So um, Thompson actually uh, led this expedition and the HMS Challenger traveled for 110,000 um, kilometers for three and a half years, collecting samples um, um, at depths up to 5.5 uh, kilometers deep. When he returned, he published a travel report, and the conclusion was um, a, both a short and historical. It says, 
that life exists at all depths at the ocean. So scientific reports of a challenger expedition were published in 50 volumes contained on almost 30,000 pages and 3,000 details illustrations. And it took 19 years to be completed. This um, later led to a number of European and uh, American oceanographic expeditions before the First War and then especially after the Second World War. The important thing that actually happened in deep sea exploration happened to be on the 23rd January 1960 when Betty Scott piloted by a Swiss researcher Jack Picard and US, US Navy officer Don Walsh reached the deepest point of the ocean, the Challenger Deep in Mariana Trench. At this depth, the researchers made a very important oceanographic observation. They saw two 30, about 30 centimeter fish swimming by. The Trieste dive remained the only dive to actually successfully reach such depths until only 2012, the deep sea submergent um, vehicle, a deep sea challenger piloted by uh, jo um, James Cameron actually reached the same depths. A uh, fun fact, Deep Sea Challenger was built in Sydney, Australia. Well, however, Trieste Betiscaf wasn't um, a good research uh, submerged, sub submerged vehicle uh, because it was very large and not very maneuverable. Clearly, a better craft was needed. So in 1964, another important thing happened. A Deep Sea Research Submersible Alvin was delivered to Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Mm -hmm. And it was commissioned and started a new era of deep sea exploration. A number of uh, nations also built their own submersibles, men submersibles in the 80s and 90s. So the results are like the um, examples here, French Nautil, Russian Mir, Japanese Shinkai, and most recently, actually, uh, the fleet was um, um, supplemented by um, Jialong, a Chinese um, submersible that can work uh, up to the depth of 7,000 kilometers. But keep in mind that Alvins were the first and uh, thus the important discovery um, of the deep were actually made with their help. Although we knew by the time that life existed um, in the ocean at, at all depths, but um, what about its diversity? How diverse, um, um, how rich um, life at, at the depth? Before 1977, biologists believed that although the energy of sunlight um, of, uh, is, is, is required in the deep sea and organisms in the deep sea would um, basically depend on the debris that would fall from the surface water. So scarce food available from the top um, meant that the abyss must be just a desert. However, this view was challenged um, by an influential paper by two American um, researchers, um, Hessel and Sanders, who actually estimated that um, Diversity is actually dependent on sample size, especially in small samples as we observe in the deep sea um, expeditions. What they found was that um, diversity in the deep sea is actually much greater than uh, that in similar temperature shell and water environments, and it's comparable with that of shallow marine tropics. However, it was 1977 that from arguably the most important discovery of the 20th century was made with, again, the help of um, Alvin. This discovery was made by geologists who were looking for um, hot hydrothermal vents around the Halapagos Rift area. But what they also found changed our very own understanding of life on planet. It was an amb amazing abundance of life communities dominated by huge tube worms like this on the right, crabs and the huge white clams. So, and this um, 
communities were actually not dependent on uh, solar energy, but um, used symbiotic hemosynthetic bacteria for food. And um, reasonably soon after that, in uh, 1983, another discovery of another hemosynthetic um, communities was, uh, was done in the eastern Gulf of Mexico. Uh, again, using Alvin and um, yeah, and again, the communities were dominated by by large tube worms, large mussels, large clams, and gorgonian corals. Um, in now we're in the 21st century, and uh, in my opinion, my humble opinion, what happened um, in the beginning of 21st century um, was actually happened important discovery was happened on February 6, 2002, when uh, Monterey Bay Research Institute um, bi biologist Robert Regen um, Regenhock was using this time actually remotely operated vehicle in Monterey Canyon, and he came across um, a carcass of a dead whale. Well, it's kind of expected given that whales live in the ocean, they should die um, in the ocean and fall to the floor. But it was actually amazing the first time the whale uh, fall was discovered. They were just bones and a bit of soft tissue and a wonderful group of organisms um, on and around, including some really strange, um, warmy looking animals like this with uh, red plumes of uh, branchia. What's interesting is that um, uh, this whale fall worms had green root-like structures that were penetrating the bones. And it later was shown that um, worms had no mouths or no stomachs, but instead they used the roots um, that contained specialized symbiotic, again, bacteria that can break down the whale worms. Another interesting thing about these amazing animals was that um, they all happened to be females and a close look at them discovered that they did have males, but the males were just microscopic males like bags of sperm, no more than that, in the tubes of females. So in uh, 2004, a paper was published in the Journal of Science and um, it was actually describing these worms in a new genus called Ocidax, which means bone devourer. Uh, the, se the senior after Greg Rouse um, was um, actually a person who was supervised by Pat, uh, Pat Hutchings as a PhD student, so there is an Australian Museum connection here as well. Uh, because of uh, its unusual habitats, the animals were also called zombie worms. And let's go back to, uh, to Australia and see what happened in Australia. Meanwhile, in Australia, well, until very recently, nothing spectacular was happening in Australia in terms of deep sea, deep sea research. We did have a research vessel, Southern Surveyor, that was being built in the United Kingdom in 1972. It was 66 meters long, had 19 single, single cabins and five twin berths. Acquired by uh, CSIRO in 1988, and it was converted into a fisheries research trawler. It was capable of sampling seafloor up to 2.5 um, kilometers and uh, um, enabled some research across biological, oceanographic, and um, geoscience di disciplines. It was decommissioned in uh, 2014, giving way to research vessel investigator, Australia's blue water research vessel. This vessel was actually built as a lab at sea in Singapore, custom built, at a cost of $120 million and was commissioned in 2015. Investigator has been described as one of the most advanced research uh, vessels in the world. It's kept, it's capable of traveling uh, 10,000 nautical miles staying in sea for 60 days stints. So, which means it can travel from equator to edge of Antarctica. And it's capable of spending up to 300 days a year at sea. 
Um, it's managed by a division of CSIRO called the Marine National Facility, 94 meters long, nine stories hard, high, and it has 60 berths accommodating up to 40 scientists. So it's capable of multidisciplinary work, such as chemistry, physics, biology, geology, ocean atmospheric. So, so it's actually, yeah, it's actually great. Um, now, what one needs to do to actually get on, on a research voyage? Uh, short of being invited, well, you, um, like we actually like can apply for a grant. So it's uh, there are annual calls for fully funded sea time grants through Commonwealth Granted Voyage Program. And applications are normally invited from Australian scientists and international collaborators and they are assessed against research quality and research benefit criteria. It's a two step process. And uh, once initial pre application is reviewed and if it's successful, a full application is invited for review. If this one is successful, game on. So successful applications are used to build the primary voyage schedule of the research vessel for that period of the year. Um, what I would like to stress um, is that every scientist uh, have been involved in the research um, vessel investigator operations from the very beginning. Here is a list of the operations um, our scientists participated in, and I would like to highlight three of them. 2015 uh, voyage to Tasmania was actually um, one of the testing, like one of the maiden voyage, only the second voyage made with some research games. So the purpose was to trial the vehicle, particularly sampling gear, establish procedures for working in the lab and obtain image, images, geochemistry and funnel samples from 100 to 2000 meters for analysis. We had Two scientists actually, from Mark and Steve, uh, as a part of um, this 15 member team um, who participated and, um, in, and processed biological samples. And some nice looking creatures from the voyage. More creatures. And uh, let's move to 2017, um, sampling the Abyss voyage. This one is particularly dear to me because I was, uh, um, it was my first um, expedition actually. The motivation for Tim Ahar, who, is a chief, who was a chief scientist again, was that um, he had a global biogeography project of working on the entire class of marine animals from museum specimens. And interestingly enough, despite this huge data set, he uh, was missing the um, specimens from this particular area, east coast of Australia, believe it or not. So um, the, this is the team members of um, um, 2017 voyage. And as you can see, it's a wonderful team of international and Australian researchers, including two Australian museum scientists. And this is Lauren Hughes, who is uh, now curator and ch at charge uh, in National History Museum now, and uh, you can recognize these two people, that's Frank and myself. So the voyage was a month long and it was grant voyage, a funded voyage uh, of 130k per day. So it's total point 4.4 uh, million operation. It was supported by CSIRO Marine National Facility and uh, Marine Biodiversity Hub. So the goal was to investigate the seafloor from the continental rise and abyssal plain of Australia's exclusive economic zone in the Tasman Sea. So we did, uh, oops, sorry, um, we did um, sample th um, 13 sites from Tasmania to Queensland, and um, each station, each operation was done at uh, 2.5 and 4 kilometers deep. And again, good looking creatures here and here. And an exciting discovery was the first whale fall in Australia and the first our own zombie worms. 
so those worms I mentioned earlier. The new species are now currently being described by Letitia Gantam in collaboration with her colleagues from National History Museum in London. And we had some other stars like this faceless uh, fish that um, was um, collected from 4,000 meters and looked like a new species until our fish expert actually found that it was um, a known species, although quite rare. It's, it's actually quite widely distributed. And also this humble sepunkling worm was for some inexplicable reason a social media star. It's also being currently described as a new species. So yes, a lot of happened in this voyage um, for 13 uh, days and um, we, like, we got lots of specimens, 47,000 specimens and nearly 1,000 lots were registered in the Australian Museum. Um, and uh, the most recent um, before this one voyage is uh, Sea Mount Coral Survey in 2018. It was led by CSIRO and Parks Australia. It was a month long voyage um, and the goal was to map cold water corals and uh, the fauna associated with uh, Tasmanian seamounts. So 40 scientists, technicians, marine park managers and communication specialists. The team included four participants from the Australian Museum and it was in two legs. So the first leg, um, it was Letitia Gantam and Francesca. And the second uh, um, included Inga and uh, Alison Miller. And again, as you guess, it's um, good looking creatures from the voyage. As usually lots of happen, I wouldn't go into these details because I think I'm running out of time. But what's important is actually the outcomes of these expeditions. They significantly improved our knowledge of Australian deep sea biodiversity. Only in uh, 2019 to 2020, 30 deep sea species were described from Australia. This includes six deep sea um, annelids, worms, two deep sea gastropods, two species of uh, crustaceans, and 20 species of carnivorous sponges. With, um, with annelids, the animals I work on, as a result of um, this expedition, we actually like we really, really made them an con important contribution. Uh, before 2017, only 15 species from six families of annelids were described from below 1,000 meters, 15 species. And in 2017, we collected 6,000 specimens and uh, we published a large paper um, with an um, international group of co-authors, like 30 authors from 18 international institutions. We recorded staggering 214 species and estimated that at least 55 of these species would be new species. So the plan now is to um, publish a special issue of records of the Australian Museum with description at least 24 species. Yeah, there are lots of new species to be described. So um, here we are basically, we have um, good news uh, that um, new funding in 2018 extended research vessel investigator to full year operations. So Australian government committed $1.9 billion uh, to up to 2020-2029 for the research infrastructure investment plan. And this uh, includes over $30 million um, to actually for research vessel investigator operations. So which means um, investigator can now offer 300 operational days of research per year. Um, well, the plans were a bit um, changed due to COVID-19, as you can imagine, but we are back at sea now. And what's next? Well, we're investigating the Australia's um, Indian Ocean territories at the current voyage. So this current cruise is actually equivalent to an approximately $6 million grant. And uh, the team of people who actually are um, uh, applied for this includes uh, Tim O'Hara again as a chief scientist and the lead investigator and principal investigators Shane Young, obviously from Australian Museum, 
Nelly de Wilson from Western Australian Museum, Alan Williams from Cesaro, and uh, Karen Miller from Ames. So, and the plan is to, for the first time, study benthic biodiversity from sea mounts. Uh, of Australian Indian territories. So we're talking basically Christmas and uh, Caucasus killing islands. So we hope to provide specimens and tissue samples to taxonomists to describe new species, to assess the conservation significance of the seamount communities, especially including those of cold water coral and sponges, and uh, examine the biogeographical relationships of the fauna with other Australian, Western Pacific and Indian Ocean faunas. And here is um, the number the people who participate in this cruise. So you can see that actually Museum Victoria has seven participants and the Australian Museum has five. And here we are. This lady, um, Alice Yan, is our new PhD um, master student. Sorry, so you probably haven't met her, but yes, yeah, she's starting uh, working with me on um, a deep sea um, uh, on a deep sea project. Yeah, so that's pretty much what we are what we are at. We hope to leave um, Port Darwin tomorrow, and uh, wish us luck. Thank you.